on this episode of Doing the Most, our top 10 tips for beginner home brewers. Moment brews and various artists, everything from me to rose. Big creation, fermentation, and heat creation, doing the most. We're just out of the holidays here at the time of publication, and you may be stumbling across this video after just receiving a homebrewing kit or homebrewing books or some other kind of homebrewing gear, maybe winemaking stuff or beer making stuff, and you're probably kind of scouring, looking for information on what to do next. As a new homebrewer, there is so much to learn. Primary, secondary, You've got yeasts and fermentable sugars, grain bills, hop schedules, wine and mead nutrients. It's just, it's a lot. And so for this video, I wanted to just give some very basic beginner tips to help you along on your home brewing journey, whether it's wine, mead, cider, or beer. These are just some bare bones, basic essentials that'll help get you started on the right track. So my friends, let's dive in. Number one, get yourself a hydrometer. This is a hydrometer, and if you've got a homebrewing kit, it may have come with one. It probably didn't come with this one. This one is made out of polycarbonate, not the fragile glass that most hydrometers are made out of. But hydrometer readings tell you a lot of information about your brews. A hydrometer will tell you things like your potential ABV, your final ABV. In some cases where you're not certain, it'll tell you whether or not fermentation started. And of course it will tell you whether or not fermentation has stalled out prematurely or if fermentation is actually done. When you're looking for help online, one of the first questions people will ask you is, what does your hydrometer say? And so you want to be armed with that information when you're looking for help. Other than sanitizer, to make sure you don't get any bad buggies in your brews, the hydrometer is probably the most important piece of gear in your home brewing arsenal. Number two, size up. I have long been an advocate for five gallon batches, and I know most new home brewers start with one gallon batches these days. That wasn't the case when I got started brewing a decade ago. And after your first batch or two, you're probably gonna have the temptation to size up. And I would obviously encourage you to do so. Do it. Sizing up does allow you to take into account economies of scale, so you can make quite a bit more brew with not that much additional cost per gallon added on. But when sizing up, be careful of glass. I've got a whole video on why you should be careful about the carboys that you choose, but there are other options like conical fermenters, five gallon buckets, or plastic carboys, similar in shape and size to this one. Some even have large mouths on them, so you can get fruit and spices and other things in and out of the carboy. Definitely size up when you're ready to do so. There are so many advantages to five gallon and larger batches. Number three, don't write off the helpfulness of kits. Now this might mean a beginner gear kit like Homebrew Ohio's beginner mead making kit that comes with a bunch of essentials for making mead. Or it might be a wine making or beer making kit with buckets and hoses and racking canes and all the stuff you need to get started. And those are typically available at your local homebrew shop. But also don't write off the value of other kits like ingredient kits. Wine kits, for example, come with the juice, the yeast, the stabilizers, and sometimes they come with grape skins for aging it on or even oak. Beer kits will come with the grains, hops, and yeast, and a full skin schedule of how your brew day is going to go so you can follow it to the letter. Wine kits and beer kits are really handy because they teach you the essentials for making wine and beer in a really granular way. They come with all the stuff, they come with all the instructions, and they hold your hand all the way through the process. I wish when I had gotten started fermenting that I had just started with wine and beer kits. I definitely spent the first couple of years hanging around winemaking talk and homebrew talk forums trying to figure it all out for myself. Piggybacking on this, number four, follow a tested, trusted recipe. A lot of BrewTube channels are not publishing tested, trusted recipes. And that's not a dig, it's just a fact of trying to generate content on a weekly basis and having to churn through brews left and right. Our channel's done a little bit of that here and there in the past, but we actually do have a playlist of tested, trusted recipes, and you can check out the link to that in the description. There are plenty of resources out there 
for tested trusted recipes. And beer kits, like I mentioned previously, are a great example of that for different beer styles. Again, because they include the hops, the grains, and the full rundown of your brew day. The wiki on r slash mead over on Reddit includes a ton of different recipes that are tested and trusted for various different styles. And for wines at home, you might check out Jack Keller's home winemaking book. Jack was a leader in the country fruit winemaking hobby for decades, and he's got all kinds of different recipes for fruits, vegetables, roots, flowers, you name it, Jack probably has a recipe for it. And a ton of those recipes are in the recently published book. Number five, keep it simple. When I first started brewing, my recipes were very complex because I just kind of wanted to do all the things, experiment with all the ingredients. The biggest problem with that is it can grow so complicated that when you like or don't like something in there, it can be difficult to determine what it was in there that you don't like or do like. Also, a big ingredients list or a bunch of different stuff happening in secondary creates a lot of moving parts, which means there are a lot more things that could potentially go wrong with your brew. Keep it simple. Number six, find your local homebrew store if you've got one. Now I know in a lot of areas, particularly a lot of areas outside of the United States, it can be difficult to find a home brewing shop, but there may be some kind of shop somewhere around that can help you with this stuff. Local homebrew shops can be invaluable. They're super helpful for beginners. They love helping out beginners get into the hobby. I actually got started in homebrewing wines because I was interested in the idea of it, stopped into the local homebrew store and they convinced me, yeah, absolutely, this is fun and you can do it and gave me a great deal on a beginner kit. Another great thing about my local homebrew shop is I can text in orders. It's super convenient because I can text over all the things that I've been logging in my notes app as things that I need to buy and they'll throw them all in a bag for me and it's ready to go when I show up. Your local homebrew store, if you have one, is an incredible resource for the new homebrewer. Number seven, don't bottle too soon leave it be. You've probably heard the old adage online that if your brew tastes bad, wait. <laughs> and it's not necessarily true that time fixes every brew, but time can definitely help with some of the funkier ones. But one thing that I see a lot from new homebrewers is this urge to get it in the bottle and drink it and share it with friends, even though it might have just come out of primary. If you just made a mead or a cider and it's really hazy, but you just bottle it anyway and you give it to a friend, and that friend puts it on a shelf and waits for a while to drink it, a lot of that hazy cloudiness is gonna end up falling to the bottom. And I have seen bottles from homebrewers that are 30, 40, maybe even 50% sediment. And that's just not something that people wanna see when they go to grab a drink. You drink with your eyes first. Even if you're not looking for a crystal clear drink, Time can definitely help smooth out some of the rough edges and at least give you something that's not gonna have a bunch of sludge in the bottom of your bottles. Be patient, don't fuss with your brews a lot, let them kinda hang out and do their thing, and bottle when it's time to bottle your brews. Number eight, if it smells good, that doesn't mean it's gonna taste good, and if it smells bad, that doesn't mean it's gonna taste bad. Smells at the beginning of fermentation can be deceiving, especially if you've just mixed up something really aromatic. And about 12 hours in, as the gas starts to push that aroma out into the air, you're gonna go, oh man, that smells good. And I see that a lot from folks, which I absolutely be enthusiastic about how great your brew smell, but don't let that put you under the impression that it's always gonna smell that way or that it's gonna taste in any way how it smells. Fermentation fundamentally changes the molecular structure of a ton of things that are happening inside your brews and that good smell may fade and may turn into a different good smell later. Additionally, if it smells bad, like if you're getting some sulfur rotten egg smells, that's also not a sign that it's going to taste bad and I've got a video on how to fix that one. Definitely get excited about your brew, definitely enjoy the smells, but also don't let it get your hopes up when something smells super good at the beginning. Because I've seen a lot of folks that are like, it smelled so good in the first 12 hours, and then three days later they're wondering what went wrong in there because it no longer smells like sweet, delicious honey or fresh pressed apple juice. Just keep in mind that smells are only one of the indicators of what's going on in your fermentation. 
Number nine, keep notes. This especially goes for tasting notes, but also keep notes on everything you've done to your brew. Maybe it's a hydrometer reading or something you added in secondary, or maybe you stabilized it. That's really important to know that you've added stabilizing chemicals and don't need to do that a second time. Keep good notes. And when it comes to tasting notes, keep good tasting notes on your stuff and even do side-by-side -side tastings with commercial products. For example, a couple years ago, I was working on a recipe that was very similar to something a local brewery was making. And so I got a couple different bottles from a couple different years of that brew and I tasted it side by side with my recipe experiments to see if I could figure out what was tasting like theirs and what was lacking in mine to make it taste as good as their beer. Tasting notes, brew logs, all very important so that way you can grow as a brewer and say you really like something that you made, you can replicate it another time. And finally, number 10, find a friend who will tell you the truth. We love to share our homebrews. It's part of the joy of the hobby, but a lot of times you're gonna have friends that tell you everything's great or, you know, everything is tolerable. What you really wanna find is the friend who will tell you exactly what they like or don't like about your brews. Our homebrews are like our children. We're biased, we made them, we think that they're great and delicious, and therefore we think everybody else is going to enjoy them just the same way. And I'm guilty of this myself. A little bit, that bias can cloud our judgment about how good or bad something we've made is. And obviously you're gonna be brewing to your palate most of the time because generally you're brewing for yourself. If you like stouts, you like a big, thick, rich, malty stout, you're gonna brew that exactly how you like it. But you're also going to be more likely to look past some of the rough edges that are in there. And when we share home brews with folks, we want them to love them. And so good feedback is really important as you grow in your home brewing hobby. Now, like I always say, different people like different things, but good feedback can help us improve and of course, see past some of those blind spots we may have due to our personal affinity if you found this video helpful, good news, we've got plenty more content where this came from. Just hit that subscribe button down there, ring the bell for notifications, and you'll never miss a new video from our channel. And also make sure you follow us on social media, join our Discord server. Our Discord is like the hidden number 11 tip on this list because there are so many helpful people in the Discord that jump at the opportunity to help guide you on your new homebrewing journey. Thanks for watching and until next time, happy brewing and cheers.